It's 11 a.m. West African time. You're watching Business Edge. I'm Esther Awuni. Welcome. On the show today, we'll bring you a conversation with a special advisor to the president on the ease of doing business, Jumake Oduwale, where she shares some insight on the outlook for the business environment in the country this year. Right after that, we'll shift our focus to the banking sector for an outlook on earnings, the regulatory environment, and prospects for mergers and acquisitions as the industry prepares for a new round of recapitalizations this year. Well, that's what we've got lined up for you today. Let's take a quick break and return to take a look at the top business headlines across the continent this morning. Stay with us. Welcome back. On to our top headlines now. Nigeria's Vice President Kashim Shatima has departed Abuja to represent Africa's largest economy at the 2024 annual meetings of the World Economic Forum scheduled in Davos, Switzerland. Now, the news of the Vice President's departure was disclosed in the State House press release signed by Stanley Nwokocha, Senior Special Advisor to the President on Media and Communications, the Office of the Vice President. That was on Sunday. Now, according to the press release, Vice President Shatima will join other political and business leaders across the world at the annual forum to discuss global socioeconomic development. Moving on, uh, Nigerian, Nigeria's, uh, when, the, when the acquisition, uh, I beg your pardon, when the acquisition involving the investment management firm BlackRock is finalized at Dubai Ogunle, the founding partner of global infrastructure partners, will have a 2.3 billion dollars uh, in net worth as per a report by Bloomberg. Ogunlesi is anticipated to become a billionaire with his acquisition. Approximately $2.3 billion uh, is estimated. That is estimated total wealth according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index uh, with a 17.5% share in global infrastructure partners. BlackRock on Friday uh, announced that it is buying Global Infrastructure Partners, a company founded by Nigerian investment banker Adebay Ogulesi in a $12.5 billion deal. But the company also said it would appoint Ogulesi to the board at the next scheduled board meeting after the close of the deal. Nigeria's commercial capital uh, is not extending its tax returns deadline. That's the government in a Lagos state through the Lagos State Internal Revenue Service uh, insists uh, its January 31st, 2024 deadline for all employers of labor to submit their annual tax returns is uh, sacrosanct. Now, the executive chairman of the LIRS, Ayodele Subair, conveyed this in an official statement to release by the agency. Sibir emphasized that employers of labor with business located within Lagos State must adhere to the deadline as failure to comply will result in penalties and other statutory sanctions outlined in Section 81, Subsection 3 of the Person, Personal Income Tax Amended uh, Amendment Act 2020-2011. Sibir urged businesses and employers to leverage the e-tax portal for filing, citing its user-friendly convenient and secure nature. Now, parts of Halteng in South Africa will be without electricity due to planned maintenance by ESCOM, leading to a nine-hour power outage. Now, the power utility uh, will do the maintenance till Thursday, 18th January. ESCOM said that the outage will affect customers in Vosloos extension 5, 6, and 16 on Thursday, that's 18 January, from uh, around 9 to uh, sometime in the evening. ESCOM said that the interruption uh, in electricity supply is necessary to perform essential maintenance on disruption on distribution power lines. Customers have been advised to treat all electrical appliances as live during the power outage. 
An IMF, uh, the Washington-based executive board of the International Monetary Fund, says it's set to meet on Wednesday, January 17, to complete the sixth review of the institution's arrangement with Kenya, including giving the green light on the disbursement of fresh funds. The meeting will be in the backdrop, the backdrop of November's state uh, staff-level agreement on economic policies and reforms required to conclude the six reviews and augmentations of the arrangements. The completion will see the multilateral lender wire an estimated 104 and 9 billion shillings, including uh, inclusive of the expansion of resources under the extended fund facility and extended credit facility, the ECF, and the first review of the resilience sustainability facility, the RSF. Well, those are our top headlines across the African continent. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll take you straight to the markets. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Welcome back. You're watching Business Edge. It's a brand new trading week for investors at the Nigerian exchange. The market kicked off trading at around 10 a.m. this morning and investors are quite optimistic for another profitable week. But let's just take a few steps back. The benchmark stock index closed the previous week positive, uh, its second weekly gain of the year, bringing the year-to-date return to just over 11%. Also, fun fact, the market's week-to-date performance uh, marks its best second week opening since 2020. Now, let's get right to the numbers now. But the OSHA index uh, closed up at 80, just over 33,000 points last week uh, with a value of 88.8 billion naira. Uh, let's go on to the volume, uh, 5.71 billion uh, in terms of the volume. And market capitalization also climbed up to 45.45 uh, trillion. Now let's go straight to the top gainers from last week. Well, there you have it. Uh, we have a Cadbury from the consumer goods sector topping the top uh, gainers from last week. Now, this is a weekly review. That's a week-to-date performance of the market last week, looking at the best performance from last week. Uh, Cadbury PLC are taking the top spot. Uh, we have Veritas Capital up 39.4%. Julius Berger uh, also climbed 32.9%. Uh, the Initiates of PLC was up 31.4%. Uh, Jai's Bank are taking the fifth spot uh, up 31%. Let's go now quickly to the top losers from last week. Dark Communications uh, lost uh, 30%. Uh, total Energy, so we have Total Energies, NEM Insurance, uh, Computer Warehouse Group down 9.2%. Uh, May and Baker uh, from the pharmaceutical sector down 7.7% on the week. Let's quickly move on now to this uh, sectoral performances, tracking the key sectoral performances that we're going to be tracking here on the show, that's the consumer goods, insurance, banking, industrial goods, and the oil and gas sector. Now, for the consumer goods, uh, that sector was up 9.6%. Uh, it's going to be a tough, it's what is a tough year for uh, retailers in 2023, and the analysts tell us that it's going to be another tough year for uh, retailers' consumer goods sector in 2024. Obviously, talking about inflation expected to continue to rise further before tapering down sometime uh, around media. So, something to look out for. Uh, insurance sector was also up 7.6%. The banking sector, still the most liquid uh, and liquid uh, sector of the market and investors' favorite. Uh, when, talk, when we talk about dividend, dividend yield uh, payout, uh, investors always uh, particularly look towards the bank. So that uh, was up 5.1% on the week. Industrial goods also positive, up 4.8%. Uh, however, we did see the oil and gas index uh, slipping. 1.6% on the week. Well, the market uh, is open for the week, uh, expecting perhaps some profitable trading for uh, investors as the market proceeds uh, to uh, in the course of the week. Uh, we'll just take another quick break and come back with the rest of the show.
Welcome back. Now, Fitch Rating says it expects the operating conditions for African banks to be as challenging in 2024 as they were in 2023, according to the ratings agency. Although lenders reported strong earnings in the previous year, they remain exposed to domestic and global operating environment risks. Joining us to unpack the outlook for Nigeria's banking industry this year is Steve Oshaw, his co-managing partner at Commercial Partners. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Morning, Esther. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, let's get right to it. I've been looking at a couple of uh, uh, research um, papers uh, put out by analysts this year, looking at Fitch, looking at Augusto and Co. And it would appear that there's a general consensus that the industry is going to continue to face uh, headwinds this year. Risks, we, as, we, as you know, there's a recapitalization exercise coming up. And also on the issue of uh, FX uh, revaluations, where we saw banks uh, making very good profit last year. Well, the, the focus for this year is that there's going to be, uh, there will be lower uh, FX revaluation gains for the banks. But I'd like to hear your thoughts in terms of what, what are you expecting on the horizon for the industry? Okay, thank you. Um, I think globally we've seen um, a very tepid and weak uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, statistics. And because of that, we've seen that even from the Fed on the tone, um, it shows that the hawkish stance that were expected for the first quarter and the second quarter of this year um, is now being put on hold until there's a clarity around the global economic space and there's improvement. And Nigeria, um, as you earlier alluded to, is not an island as regards all these uh, issues. Um, although on our side, we've seen the positive impact in terms of uh, banks, you know, um, returns and rev for last year. Um, the first quarter, sorry, the last year, financial year is actually not officially out. Um, but at least if you look at what we saw from the nine months uh, results that are presented by banks, saying that, you know, due to the revaluation effect you mentioned, um, accretion in terms of net interest income uh, for the past um, 12 or nine months uh, period that was recorded was very positive. And you've seen that reactions in the NGX market, how some of the first year, second tier banks have actually, you know, hit the um, trillion market cap. Um, even though this is a far, you know, cry away from if you have a $1 trillion economy, um, how do you think these banks can support them um, in terms of number compared to the rest of the world? Um, I think there's a bit of that. But again, um, from what we've seen so far, it's a positive reaction. And I think we're going to see more of that in 2024. Although 2024 will come with own challenges, but at the same time, I think the banks will still do positive, um, uh, you know, uh, practically well in 2024. And if you look at the way um, the interest rates have gone up, you've seen that a lot of banks are actually, you know, um, to me, most time is more of like the low hanging fruit uh, investment for them. And with the year that we've seen now, um, especially on OMO and NTBs, and as well as government bonds, you see that there's going to be a lot of um, spread of, of income coming to the bank's uh, balance sheet going to 2024. Well, that being said, let's talk about the bank's loan book growth for 2024 and opportunities that they will be looking at. Yes, there's the FX interest, high interest rate environment that they will benefit from, uh, still the FX revaluation on the side. But uh, as thinking about their role as a financial, uh, how they help to grow the economy, uh, we know that this year uh, we have seen on the last couple of months running into this year, we have seen uh, the cash reserve ratio, uh, the CRR uh, levels rise. But I'm just wondering, where do you see banks uh, seeking opportunities this year, perhaps even outside of the traditional sectors where they would usually uh, play uh, for, for profit? Well, like I said, the traditional sector, like you mentioned, would be one of those areas that the banks will be looking at, and they will take advantage of that. Um, another area is the increase or the rise in the interest rates, um, especially around the government uh, issuances on bonds and TBOs that could take advantage of that. And the primary aim of actually lending or increase their loan portfolio will be another area which, where they are going to look at. Um, even though the interest rates have gone up, um, I still think um, there will be a lot of income or spread income that will come from that extension of credit. 
although banks are actually been very careful um, uh, due to a slight increase in the NPA ratio, which has been going up, especially from the first year banks. And you understand um, during the last regime of the, uh, the past uh, CBN governor, they try to ex they have tried to encourage, encourage banks to actually extend credits to um, the risk sector. And that's, you know, we saw that with extensions of credit to a lot of agri-sector, sector, manufacturing sector, um, and the likes. So I think going to 2024, I still see a lot of that going forward, although the manufacturing sector from the, um, what we've seen uh, for the past few, few, few months, I think a lot of them actually not had it very good because with the high interest rate regime, um, high inflation, it's actually directly impacting on, on the businesses, uh, which I think they are one of the biggest clients to banks. So if you look at that area, we'll probably maybe slow down in terms of credit extension to that area, but there's other really, uh, um, other areas of this economy that actually need some credits. You know, we have the FinTech, we have um, agri sectors, we have um, um, telecoms and so on and so forth, who are actually looking for money. And if you look at the capital raise last year, uh, from the capital markets, uh, a loan in CP, you agree with me that um, some of those would actually piggyback to banks to, to see how they can actually soften in terms of getting some credit from the banks rather than just going back to the capital market all the time at a very decent and competitive rate. Let's talk about one key highlight uh, that uh, we will be watching this year in the industry, and that's the recapitalization uh, exercise that the CBN has called for. It did that last year. Uh, talk to us about what we can expect in terms of prospects. There's been talk about uh, possible mergers and acquisitions, uh, but what do you foresee uh, playing out in terms of how the exercise, uh, when the exercise commences? Well, as I, you know, there hasn't been any clarity around what CBN actually wants to do in terms of the capital requirement for banks, uh, whether it's going to be regional, national, or uh, merchant banking license, uh, capital base. We've not had any clarity around what CBN is actually proposing. But if you go, if you, you know, try to use what happened in 2004, uh, if I'm correct, I think that was the last time we had a capitalization bank, uh, which was moved from $2 billion to over $25 billion. Um, capital base. So I think that will probably be a base. And if you look at how um, value has been eroded in terms of the currency between that time and now, um, you agree with me that uh, probably if you are trying to grow into one trillion economy, the possibility is there that you have to address that capital base of banks. Um, in 2004, when we moved to 25 billion uh, Naira capital base, 25 billion equivalents to Naira that to dollar that time about 185 to 187 using an exchange rate of about I think it was around 130 or 120. I'm not I'm not particularly sure now, but it's within that bracket. So right now, if you transpose that to what we have, that's re relatively about 20 million dollars, 25 million dollars, depending on the exchange rate you are using. So um that's you know sparks up that con conversations and controversy around do we need to address that? And if that is addressed. Um, the modality is going to be checked by CBN and say this is what we think, you know, the capital base or the minimum requirement base will be for banks. And if you want to compete, you know, with the world economy, um, when we're already talking about one trillion GDP in 2024, end of 2024, then it's time or high time we started, you know, putting that in place. And we want to compare ourselves with the rest of the world. Um, if you look at France, for example, uh, which has over one trillion dollar um, GDP. So um, you look at the banking sector, BMP is one of the biggest, or probably the biggest in, in, in France. You look at, you know, um, the, the, the market cap alone is over 61 billion euro. You know, and you look at the rest of Africa. Uh, if you see the giant of Africa, look at South Africa, look at Standard Bank in South Africa, look at first round Merchant Bank and, and, and the rest, and look at what their capital base or, you know, uh, uh, the market caps are. In Nigeria today, I think if you if you look at our most capitalized bank, uh, which probably be Standard Bank, I think we are ranked about 15 or 20 in Africa. You know, which means that we are not there yet. So the possibility that CBN is thinking, or the the fact that CBN is thinking around that, um, I think is the right decision and the uh, the right step in the right direction. But we need to um, get the modalities and how some of these things will pan out in terms of what criteria they're going to use. Uh, to to address what the, the capital base of the bank would be. If we used the 2000, 2004 reference, 
um, we're talking about when they move to two to 25 billion, that's about 14 X. So now if you apply that same number, so we might be looking at the region between 300 to 350 billion um, for mostly first year banks. So I don't know if that's what they're going to use or um, the percentage you're going to use in terms of the capital of the bank. So, but that's what I think. Well, still on the regulatory uh, outlook for the sector this year, uh, right now, we know that the CRR uh, is still around uh, just over 32 percent. Of uh, We know that that continues to have implications for the interest rate environment and for you know, businesses who want to borrow cash, cost of credit, etc. That whole mix of uh, high interest rates, loan environment and how it impacts on businesses. Profit for the banks, yes, but you know, still stressing that uh, financial intermediation role of the banks. But uh, what, what is your outlook for the... Uh, regulatory environment this year on the side of, uh, for instance, the, man the monetary policy uh, committee and the kind of pronouncements that you're looking, that you're expecting uh, will be made this year? I think um, this year, from all the statistics or the macroeconomic numbers that we've seen, uh, you agree with me that inflation has been one of those factors that, you know, the monetary policy authority will be looking at addressing. Um, they've put a target from the budget numbers over 21% from the high of 28.2% that we have right now. Um, and we know that, you know, from what that number is, uh, food inflation and imported inflation has actually been part of what has been driving the number. Um, so I don't know how that will pan out eventually. Um, the bigger infant in the room is actually exchange rates as well. Um, those are the things that the central bank and the monetary policy authorities will be looking at addressing. Um, they've put some mechanism in place in terms of improving the liquidity in the, in the, in the, in the interbank market. We've seen the Afrexim um, and NPC loan that was taken, about $3.2 billion. Um, the effect of that has actually not been felt too much in the market. How that is going to be used to, you know, push on the effect of the Inara dollar exchange rate running away is something we have to wait and see. But again, like I said, I think inflationary targeting and exchange rate normalization that has been done is how to address this to make sure that we don't have that much of pressure on the exchange rate and that's not actually having a future effect into some other factors or the numbers into transportation, energy costs and all of that. Um, I think that would mostly determine how uh, the monetary policy authority would actually reflect on and address the issues in the market apart from the regulatory um, side they're looking at in terms of capitalization for banks. All right, uh, if I could just quickly squeeze in uh, one last question. Valuations for banking stocks in 2024, what are your projections? What, what research, uh, what is your analysis telling you? Well, valuation for banks is already seen, um, well, like I said, has already been seen from the numbers we've seen from the NGX. Uh, most of the first banks, uh, sorry, most of the first year banks are um, already hitting the trillion market cap. Um, which just means that the valuation will actually go up uh, significantly. And I think based on the number that's released by the end of this year, which is going to come out before the end of the first quarter for the year in 2023, will also determine how far the valuation of some of these banks would, you know, uh, would, would be viewed. But like I said earlier, or like you mentioned earlier, I think we're going to see a lot of mergers and acquisition going to 2024 because that's the only way forward um, if you want to achieve the number we're looking at because I'm not too sure that a lot of banks or most of them will be able to recapitalize by the time the schedule from the CBN actually come out or will be able to meet that recapitalization um, numbers by the time the numbers come out from the CBN. But again, um, I think it's going to be a good one for most banks, uh, especially the first year and the second year banks in Nigeria. Right, Steve, thank you so much. We appreciate your time with us on the show today. Steve Ashok, co-managing partner, commercial partners, taking us through uh, the outlook for Nigeria's banking sector in 2024. Uh, we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we head straight to our international headlines. Join us again. The global economy faces a year of subdued growth prospects and uncertainty stemming from a geopolitical strife, tight financing conditions and a disruptive impact of artificial intelligence, a survey of top economists released on Monday found. A recent survey of over 60 chief economists worldwide conducted 
uh, in anticipation of the World Economic Forum in Davos that showed. The report highlights subdued growth prospects and heightened uncertainty due to geopolitical tensions, stringent financing conditions, and the transformative influence of artificial intelligence. A notable 56% of respondents foresee a weakening of global economic conditions in the current year with considerable regional variations. While optimism surrounds China and the US, Europe is anticipated to experience only modest or very limited growth. Uh, on, on the other side, South Africa and the East Asia Pacific region exhibits a more positive outlook with a majority expecting at least a moderate growth in 2024. Despite indications from leading central banks that interest rates have peaked, 70% of those surveyed anticipate a relaxation of financial conditions as inflation recedes and labor market tight tightness diminishes. Moving on, still in Europe, German farmers were expected to fill the streets around Berlin's Brandenburg Gate on Monday in a massive protest to demand a rethink of plans for higher taxes on farming operations. The, process, the protests are expected to draw 3,000 tractors, 2,000 trucks and 10,000 people from around the country and will cap a week of nationwide unrest that has put further strain on Chancellor Olaf Scholz's coalition as it grapples with the budget mess and rising far-right forces. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Christian Lindner plans to address the protesters and coalition party leaders uh, have been invited, invited leaders of the demonstration for talks. Elsewhere, bank valuations could rise by $7 trillion in five years. Uh, that's a, a study. Global banks could boost their valuations by combined $7 trillion in the next five years if they take major steps to promote growth and boost productivity. The Boston Consulting Group said in a report on Monday, the lenders could roughly double their current valuations if they pursue growth and improved price to book ratios despite obstacles. The consultant said about 75% of bank stocks had price to book ratios below one in 2022, while price earnings multiples were almost half of 2008 levels. Meanwhile, shareholder returns on bank stocks have lagged those of major market indices indexes since the crisis and the gap continues to widen. A China central bank held a key interest rate as concerns about uh, yuan volatility and the still distant prospects of Federal Reserve easing uh, the limits, limit the room policymakers have to support the economy. The People's Bank of China maintained the rate on its uh, one-year policy loan on Monday, disappointing investors expecting the first trim since August, while the central bank pumped more cash into the system to meet demand for funding. Another round of quick credit numbers on Friday had boosted expectations for bolder steps. Figures released Friday showed China made its longest uh, deflationary street since 2009 in December, while financing and loan growth last month missed expectations and exports fell annually last year for the first time since 2016. And at the commodities market, oil edged higher as the risk that airstrikes by US and its allies against the Houthis could ignite a wider conflict and disrupt crude flows from the Middle East it was balanced by soft fundamentals. Brent crude, Brent crude rose towards $79 a barrel and West Texas Intermediate was near $73 a barrel after the U.S. followed up on the initial strikes against targets in Yemen with a fresh attack on a radar installation. And while the global benchmark was up more than 4% at one point on Friday, it ended the session with a relatively modest gain of 1.1%. While global oil markets have been transfixed by the situation in the Middle East since the Hamas attack on Israel on the 7th of October, and as Israel's assault continues, all of the warring parties fighting for, for control of the Red Sea, the West and the Iran-backed Houthi militants have vowed not to back down. We'll take another quick break and when we come back, the rest of Business Edge continues. Join us again.
Nigerian businesses had a tough operating year in 2023 owing to several factors, including a spike in inflation, a weak in IRA, infrastructure challenges, among other things. However, head of the Presidential Enabling Business Council and a special advisor to the President on the ease of doing business, Jumoke Oduwali, says ongoing reforms targeted at improving the business environment for micro, small and medium enterprises will continue in 2024. We spent Q4, you know I was reappointed in October, so I just decided to take a step back. It's a new administration, it's a new team, and they had been making some reforms already over the summer. So as a team, we took a step back to really spend time deep thinking and strategizing, and we delimited, we reduced the agencies of focus to 36. Um, not to say that the others are not important, but we decided to sort of not to try and boil the ocean to try and be a bit more targeted in this uh, interface as we ramp up. So we have five pillars, four you know, one is new. So the four you know is the regulatory pillar, which is now BFA that is legally binding, focusing on those 36 and tracking their compliance to that executive order. We have our legislative and judicial pillar, which will be the reiteration of uh, the omnibus bill, starting a new omnibus bill, scooping legis legislative irritants in, in the business climate. So working with Nigerian Bar Association, Section of Business Law, and the Nigeria Economic Summit Group to look at just engaging with private sector. Uh, judiciary, we continue to work with the state judiciaries and the small claims court, looking at automation and case management, automation and upload of judgments, and then we have our strategic communications pillar, which is why we're here. We're trying to ramp up the messaging so that businesses across Nigeria know exactly what the reforms are, which brings me to perhaps one of our most engaging um, pillars, which is the subnational. Yes, yes. Sabre is on live. States completed year one of the Sabre. That's, seven, that's our $750 million program with the World Bank. 31 states signed up. Uh, SABA handles from land registration to um, regulatory policy for fiber optics, encouraging private sector tax reform um, to what else, PPP regulations and legislations, a number of things, and of course, regulatory climate across those states, working, drilling down on those areas. Now, the new one, that's the four existing pillars that you know of. The new one is our perfect business champions focusing on medium and larger size enterprises. So the medium size enterprises are identified, we're in the process of identifying them using the amount of revenue they generate, the amount of taxes they pay, the amount of jobs they create, the sectors they're in, the amount of export proceeds they generate if they do engage in exports. Those businesses that kind of have a disproportionate effect on the ecosystem, the MSMEs that cluster around them in various leading sectors, and then there are 23, currently 23 businesses in Nigeria that earn over a billion dollars in revenue a year. Uh, they generate over a billion dollars in revenue. And we need to support them as they want to be supported. There are only 23 in Nigeria. Africa has about 345, a good about half of them in South Africa. So just having 23 in Nigeria for the size of the Nigerian economy what we want to see is those businesses thrive, and we want to get more businesses into that bucket. So that's why we have a bit of a strategy shift to focus on larger businesses that going forward. I wanted to talk more about the, uh, the sub-nationals, because uh, I guess, I mean, that's where, in terms of where the impact is felt the most, at the, at the state and the sub-national uh, level. Uh, how strong is this partnership with the state government uh, in terms of uh, how, they're, you know, how they're working with you how uh, it's changing. You and I have talked about, you know, mindset, behavioral change, you know, in the past about, you know, leaning more, you know, reducing the red tape, leaning more on technology, et cetera. Is it significantly better now? Is your work it, it better is, now in, that, in that area? Our relationship, first of all, is fantastic. I really enjoy working with the state government at subnational level. We started the Pebec Neck collaboration in 2017, and it's been going from strength to strength. 
we work with all the states and the FCT. Of course, some are more engaged than others. You recall, Esther, that we have a Ease of Doing Business report, the Nigerian Homegrown Ease of Doing Business report, which we release every two years. So we released last year in March, the second edition. So next year, 2025, there'll be another ranking coming out. The response we get from the National Economic Council and the Nigeria Governors Forum has really been, I really can't complain. It's non-political, all governors are engaged, the, their teams are engaged, and so we've been having a good collaboration. The program with the World Bank gives an opportunity to put some money on the table. It's a loan, it forms part of the external borrowing plan that was approved on December 30. And um, this gives an opportunity to have a bit of a sweetener to the hard work, it's, it's uh, performance for results, and when they deliver the results, then they get some of the money on the table. So it's going quite well. We like the, the interaction with colleagues at the subnational level and working with the uh, Governors Forum Secretariat and uh, Ministry of Finance Home, Home Finance Departments. The PEVEC um, team has been able to develop a very robust program for the subnational level. I wanted to take you back to the judicial judicial reforms. Uh, PEBEC will be seeking to increase the number of small claims court nationwide mm -hmm. to 25% of states mm -hmm. and FCT. How important, uh, just you know, for the benefit of our viewers, are these small claims courts? The small claims courts are particularly popular with MSMEs because it, it provides a significant access to justice that wasn't there previously. What small claims courts are, are courts at the magistrate's level of each state. It's part of the judicial system that can handle uh, liquidated damages, usually not too large amounts, right, about 10 million and below, uh, really in line with magistracy across the country. But you can have self-representation, there are relaxed rules of evidence, there's no adjournments, um, there's, it's a 60-day timeline, 90-day including execution. So I've, I've visited small claims courts, I've sat in the proceedings, it's really efficient. Lagos State started in 2018 and so started with 15 courts and now has 19 and has dispatched 8,700 cases using the small claims courts. That's people self-representing, that's no legal fees, that's no adjournments, that's just buying a form of about 1,000 Naira to self-represent. So if you owe me, say, 3 million Naira and you're refusing to pay and I've been asking and, yes, you know, so traders, um, people are suing their banks, people are suing each other, and it's just, you know, what we even heard was that by the time you get the summons, people are just like paying because they can't even believe that so they're there's being already sued. a reputation yes, that it yes, will be seen yes. to justice will be served, well, justice uh, will as, be. It, as it were. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about uh, feedback mechanisms uh, because obviously that handshake with the private sector uh, is very important, you know, feeling the pulse of where their pain points are, et cetera. How is that going? Yeah, so we'd like to see a lot more traction in that area. We're really going to focus on our strategic communications intervention this year. You would recall we had our PEBEC, the future is here play, sort of satire to bring to the fore uh, different reforms like the, the registering of a business, like paying of taxes, like visa on arrival, like the small claims court. It was a comedy. It was very well received in Lagos and Abuja. We are trying to make sure that we meet businesses where they are, whether it's on the radio, TV, online, depending on the age demographics and the sector also, just so that businesses know what's already available. The Perfect Secretariat has delivered over 180 verifiable reforms. Yeah, some, of course, with agencies, some have unwound, and then we're back again auditing to, to make sure that they're back, back again. But that's the nature of transformation work anywhere in the world. So strategic communications is an important part of this work, and without it, if, if your stakeholders don't know what you've done, then you might as well have not, you're blinking in the dark, basically. So, so we're, really, we're really focusing on that this year. But what is the feedback that you're getting? I asked that question because uh, it did occur to me that it's possible that some people will hear, when they hear PEBEC, or when they hear the word, the phrase, uh, ease of doing business, mm -hmm. uh, and they say, oh, I'm a business, but I've never heard of them, or how can they make my life as a business? Okay. So we have different, and it's, and it's quite a stark difference, actually. The businesses that are informed and know about the PEBEC really love our report, Gov, for instance. Businesses tell us that if they even mention PEBEC at some regulator offices, they're like, this is, this is, what did you say you want? Don't report us to PEBEC. Well, so that's, that's really good. That's good feedback. <laughs> yeah. 
the, the report go uh, mechanism has not had as much traction as we would like. We want a lot more. So for the number of businesses we have in the country, MSMEs, we need a lot more to know and use about it. We meet people every day who have never heard about the PEBEC. I just spoke at the First Bank Outlook Breakfast. We still meet businesses every day who have never heard. And PEBEC is now seven years old. And we're speaking on the news. I can't count how many times you've interviewed me in the past. So it's continuous. What it shows is that it's a journey of continuous improvement. You cannot stop on your strategic communications. It's our duty to make sure that what we're doing is, is known. And so you, we try to chronicle where those businesses are. So if we meet a business that has never heard about Pebec ever, then we're like, OK, what news channels? How does that sector? Because we take it as a, as a flag for whatever demographic. How do they consume information? And then we have to go right there. So those are part of the stakeholder mapping that we do, the sentiment analysis, what, what exactly is the pulse. There are people who know about Pebec but don't believe the reforms would work. There are people who know about Pebec and have tested it and found it to be true. There are people who give us the feedback that that reform was working well. Now it's no longer as effective as it was. So some of our stakeholders help us with mystery shopping, yeah, telling us what's going on. Some of our, our stakeholders, because we work with the funnel system, as you know, so we, we scoop up whatever is happening, whatever we're even hearing, even on social media, and we start looking into it. Yeah. So finally, I mean, so much work uh, for you to do and this year. And I mean, just looking back seven years, like you said, you and I have spoken on a number of, of occasions. Uh, it's, it's a Herculean task, uh, the Nigerian uh, business uh, environment. But we have seen progress. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, uh, as, we, as we wrap up, over about seven years now, what's it been like for you uh, at the helm uh, of affairs? Uh, I mean, you've also transitioned from one government administration to another one. Uh, what, yeah. what are you looking forward to? Um, I'm looking forward to more impact. So we measure the return on, uh, our return on investment, so to speak, for, for the work that we put into it. We want to see more impact. The team works really hard, and we want it to count. So. Personally, having committed eight years to the last administration and being invited, given another opportunity to serve, I'm looking for a situation where the work now really exponentially, we have an inflection point. I know that Mr. President is committed. He's held himself out as the chief investment officer. Investment has been added to my portfolio. So just making sure that means we focus on domestic businesses, making sure that businesses operating in this climb are much more enabled so that they feel confident to plow back their, their profits into this economy and that they give the best testimonials to attract foreign investment. Dr. Jumake, I must thank you for your time. <laughs> and of course, we wish you all the best. Uh, thank, you, Esther, thank, thank you, Esther. So thank you. Yeah. That was our exclusive conversation with the special advisor to the president on the ease of doing business, looking at what to expect from the business environment in 2024. But that's it on our show for today. Remember to follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. Head to our website, newscentral.africa, and download our mobile app on Play Store and App Store. Till next time, I'm Esther Wuni. Thank you for joining us today.